that they can. Sometimes it's by um, raising funds. Often it was by uh, doing programs. As I said, programs were always a part of the Friends of the Libraries, always to bring free programs to the community. Uh, we want the, you all to learn something new, nurture that spark of curiosity, take that to your library and find a book or a DVD or a database that helps you stay in touch with the things that you learn about through programs that we're able to um, offer here at the Hanley Regional Libraries. Um, before I introduce our presenter, I want to say a little bit about the format. Um, this program is on Zoom as well as on Facebook, and we'd like you to put your um, questions in the chat box, either on Facebook or uh, on the Zoom, and we can get to those toward the end of the program. Sometimes uh, our presenter maybe bring those up along the way, but we'll be able to get to them at the end. Um, as I said, we're recording it, and in a few days, the recording will be on the YouTube, uh, the library's YouTube channel. You'll be able to pull that up later, watch it again, share it with friends, share it with someone that may not have been able to make it tonight. So. Um, just want to let you know about that. Uh, and the YouTube link is at the bottom of the library's website page. So now we'll get on to the good part about why we're here. Um, I'm to introduce our speaker, um, John T. Fowler II. He's a public historian employed by the National Park Service as a park ranger and volunteer coordinator at National Capital Parks East. He serves at the following parks, Carter G. Woodson Home, Frederick Douglass National Historic Sites, and the Mary Mc Cloud Bethune Council House. Some of you may have seen Mr. Fowler who gave a very interesting presentation about Carter Woodson um, to us here. He was able to travel here back in February 2019 and now he's come to us again virtually to talk about the amazing Mary McLeod Bethune. So here's Mr. Fowler. Take it away. Thank you. Good evening everyone. Thank you for taking the time out to join us this evening. And let me thank Mrs. Dickinson again for the invitation. We here at National Capital Parks East greatly appreciate you for that. So as she said, my name is John Fowler and I'm the park ranger and digital media coordinator for National Capital Parks East. So before we get started with uh, talking about uh, Mrs. Bethune, I wanna talk to you a little bit about what we do in National Capital Parks East. Uh, just to put a few things in context. So National Capital Parks East is a conglomerate of uh, national park sites in Washington, D.C. and into the Maryland suburbs. And I have the uh, honor and pleasure of serving at the three historic homes in the National Park Service located in the District of Columbia that honor the contributions of African Americans. And as Mrs. Dickinson stated, those homes are the Frederick Douglass National Historic Site, the Carter G. Woodson Home National Historic Site, and the Mary McLeod Bethan Council House National Historic Site. And um, uh, this July will be my 11th year with the Park Service uh, and at uh, the Mary McLeod Bethan Council House specifically. Um, as uh, Ms. Dixon also uh, talked about, I did come to the library two years ago to talk about Dr. Carter G. Woodson. And it's fitting that, you know, uh, before I get started, I got to say a little bit of something, a little bit of, uh, of something about Dr. Woodson because he is the reason why we are celebrating Black History Month. So for those of you who don't know, Carter G. Woodson is considered to be the father of African American history. And he is the man who established in 1926 Negro History Week which we celebrate today as Black History Month. Dr. Woodson is the man who did the research, who wrote the books, who taught the teachers, who disseminated the history, who institutionalized the history. So without Carter G. Woodson, uh, none of this would be possible. And so uh, hopefully once things uh, in the world get back to normal, you can come visit us at the Carter G. Woodson Home National Historic Site in DC where you will literally be in the place where the birthplace of Black History Month. And now we can move on to talking about Dr. Woodson's very good friend, uh, Mrs. Mary McLeod Bethune. I don't know if we have any um, alumni from Bethune-Cookman University, 
Um, but uh, alumni always tell me that they don't necessarily call her Mrs. They call her doctor. So to some, she's Mrs. And to some, she's Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. Um, and, you know, Mrs. Bethune, as I like to call her, um, is one of the most important figures in all of American history. She's my absolute favorite. Dr. Woodson is a close, a very close second, but there's just something about Mrs. Bethune. And by the time we finish here this evening, I think you probably agree with me why Mrs. Bethune is just a little bit more special. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen here because I prepared a few slides just to show, provide you with some images. So hopefully you can see my screen. Now I'm going to, okay. So hopefully you can see my screen. So uh, we're gonna talk about Mary McLeod Bethune's legacy. It's a very uh, interesting, unique and important legacy, not only to uh, you know, black Americans, um, not to only Americans, but uh, Mrs. Bethune, uh, was a, a international figure. And we'll talk about that today or this evening as well. The image that you see uh, was taken by the Johnson Publishing Company who published Ebony Magazine and Jet Magazine. This image was actually the cover of Ebony Magazine's uh, 1949 issue, I believe. And it's probably my favorite image of Mrs. Bethune. Here you see her in her uh, her, her first stole standing in front of the United States Capitol. Um, this is the image that I recall seeing, you know, growing up in Ebony Magazine, Jet Magazine, and uh, when, you know, you learned about Mary McLeod Bethune in the textbooks and things of that nature. So as I said, Mary McLeod Bethune is one of the most important figures in all of American history. Um, and she came from Maysville, South Carolina. She was the 15th of her parents' 17 children, the first to be born free and the first to receive an education. Um, so right out the gate, Ms. Bethune was special. Uh, imagine, uh, you know, being born during the time that she was born, all that she would have seen and encountered. She's born during, uh, during the time of reconstruction here in America, uh, during a time of legal segregation. Um, so you see a portrait here of her parents, Samuel and Patsy, and you also see a uh, picture of the cabin in which she was born July 10th, 1875. Mrs. Bethune, uh, again, I told you she's the first to be born free, the first to receive an education. She uh, is able to receive an education because uh, the Presbyterian Church sends missionaries to Maysville to start uh, a school there for the children in Maysville. And it is there that Mrs. Bethune meets her first teacher, Miss Emma Wilson. Emma Wilson will have a very uh, strong and significant impact on Mrs. Bethune in her life. Um, and it is under, Mrs. Bethune, uh, under Emma Wilson's tutelage that Mrs. Bethune just excels. Mrs. Bethune was a, a naturally gifted and talented student. She had a hunger, a thirst for knowledge, for education. And when you encountered her, even when she was a little girl, you, you could just immediately see that and sense that um, she was not only, you know, she not only carried herself a certain way, um, but she, she, you know, she talked a certain way, she, she carried herself a certain way, and then also she looked different from a lot of the people uh, there in Maysville, and that she was, uh, her, she had a, lot, a darker uh, complexion. She was a dark-skinned, uh, young lady there and she had strong African features and that set her apart even from some members of her family. They say that she was the, the darkest in her family. So again, automatically she was set apart and um, I like to say that she was anointed uh, for all of those who uh, you know believe in, in that 
sort of thing. So she's educated there at that missionary uh, school in Maysville, South Carolina. She excels and she gets a scholarship from Mary Christman to attend the Scotia Seminary in Concord, North Carolina. And it is from at Scotia, she graduates with the equivalent of a high school diploma. Mary Crispin gives Mrs. Bethune another scholarship and she goes to the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, Illinois. And it's from Moody that she's taught uh, uh, biblical principles. Uh, it was her idea. She wanted to grow up and be a missionary. She wanted to be a missionary and she wanted to go to Africa to do her missionary work. So she graduate, graduates from Moody with the equivalent of a college degree. And then she writes the Presbyterian Church to say that she's ready to do her work as a missionary in Africa. However, the Presbyterian Church writes back saying that they are not sending African Americans to Africa to be missionaries. Go figure. Disappointed, she you know, regroups and she ultimately decides that if she can't do that work that missionary work in Africa, there's still a lot to do here in her home. So she decides to stay here in America and to become an, an educator herself and to eventually start her own school for African-American girls. So you see this image of Mrs. Bethune when she's graduating uh, or when she you know, finishes at Moody. And I show these images of Mrs. Bethune as a younger woman because a lot of times when you see images of Mrs. Bethune and you know, you're talking about her, you see a lot of images of her when she's an older woman. Um, but I just wanted to showcase some of these images of her as a young woman. So Mrs. Bethune gets married to Albertus Bethune. He's also a school teacher. Um, they have uh, their only, she has her only child, Albert. And then, you know, she begins teaching. Um, she teaches at several schools uh, throughout the South. Her first school was the Haynes Normal and Industrial Institute, which was established by Lucy Craft Laney. Um, Lucy Craft Laney is someone that I think you all should uh, do some research on. She's an important figure. Lucy Craft Laney is one of the first women in the United States to start a school. Uh, and certainly the first African-American woman to start a school. And so she's a very important figure, not only in American history, but in Mrs. Bethune's life. Mrs. Bethune later wrote that it was working with Lucy Lane that she understood the, the, the power and the importance of education in the emerging struggle for civil rights for Black folks in America. Uh, Mrs. Bethune, one of my favorite quotes of her, she will say often, you know, we firmly believe that education has the irresistible power to dissolve the shackles of slavery. Eventually, Mrs. Bethune starts her school, relocating to Daytona Beach, Florida to do so. October 3rd, 1904, she starts her school, the Daytona Norman Industrial Institute for Negro Girls, and she starts this school with $1.50 and faith in God. That's how she always told the story. She starts out with five girls, ages eight to 12, plus her son, Albert, who was by this time five years old. So she has the support, the help of the black community there in Daytona Beach, Florida. She also has the support of wealthy philanthropists. Daytona was a resort town and a lot of wealthy, uh, white philanthropists had vacation homes there. And so Mrs. Bethune uh, got the idea to try to get some money from these folks. And so what she would do is, for example, she uh, would teach her students uh, Negro spirituals and, and, and these songs to perform. She taught them uh, Shakespearean uh, the, the sonnets and different poems to recite. And they'd go around to these resort towns to uh, raise funds to, uh, for her school. And it's on these occasions that she met three of the wealthiest men in the United States, John D. Rockefeller, James Gamble, one of the sons of Procter and Gamble, and Thomas White of White Sewing Machine Company. Sewing, uh, Machine Company. 
And these three men what hold of her vision. Mrs. Bethune had the innate ability when you research Mrs. Bethune, you see so many different accounts of how she had the ability to cast her vision and make it plain. So much so that you believed what she was saying. You believed, you accepted what she was saying. There's an account where she's talking about uh, taking, uh, I believe it's Rockefeller out to a, 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 a dump. And she was recounting how she was, this is the place that she was gonna build her school. And she's saying, can't you see my, my, my school? Can't you see my college? Over there, we've got the science building. We got the administration building. We have some dormitories. She was saying these things. She was speaking those things as though they were. And, you know, you probably have some people probably thought to themselves, this black lady is crazy. She's seen things that aren't there, but um, we know they were there and they were there because she saw it, she believed it. She uh, believed it in her mind and she believed it in her heart. And that is how she built this school that grew into a college. Bethune-Cookman College, it became internationally known as Bethune-Cookman College, now University. So not only is Mary McLeod Bethune one of the first women in the United States to you know, start a school, she's the first African-American woman to serve as a college president. So if you're wondering, the school goes through various name changes, various uh, you know, program adjustments, uh, adjustments from you know, like an elementary, junior high, high school, and eventually uh, to a fully accredited four-year college. The Cookman comes from the Cookman Institute. So again, Bethune's idea originally was to educate black girls. When she, the school murders with the Cookman Institute in the mid-20s, the Cookman Institute was a school for African-American boys in Jacksonville, Florida. So that is where Bethune Cookman uh, gets its name. So again, you see these images of Mrs. Bethune and her students on the campus of the school. Um, when the school first started, you heard in the title the word uh, normal. So the normal education back then consisted of your three R's, the reading, writing, and arithmetic, as they'd say. And then the industrial education component your cooking classes, your sewing classes, home economics, dressmaking, uh, you know, building, things of that nature. So that is the, or well, that was the nature of most of these schools back then, uh, particularly in the South. While um, building her school, Mrs. Bethune, becomes very active and engaged in the community there in Daytona Beach, Florida. I encourage you all to pick up uh, Mary McLeod Bethune in Florida, bringing uh, social justice to the Sunshine State, written by my good friend and colleague, Dr. Ashley Roberts of Preston. In that book, Dr. Uh, Preston uh, talks about the lengths that Mrs. Bethune went, to, went through to get not only her school uh, on the ground, but also uh, the way that she engaged the community there in uh, Daytona Beach, Florida. Uh, not only did she have the school, but she started a hospital uh, uh, on the campus of the school because one night one of the students uh, uh, was uh, very ill and when they took the student to the hospital, uh, the hospital there did not accept the student. And so Mrs. Bethune started a hospital. It was called McLeod Hospital. She named it in honor of her parents. Mrs. Bethune uh, uh, was uh, an owner of, uh, part owner of a life insurance company there in uh, Daytona Beach. She owned a beach as well, Bethune uh, Volusia Beach uh, in uh, uh, Daytona. Um, you know, she was involved in suffrage, um, getting uh, the black community there in Daytona registered to vote. All these things you can 
learn more about in Dr. Robertson Preston's book. So she's making a name for herself in Daytona, but she also begins to make her name, name for herself nationally. Mrs. Bethune, while trying to raise funds for her school, stumbles across a meeting of the National Association of Colored Women, which is this country's oldest um, organization created by and for African Americans, started in 1896. Um, it was at this meeting that Mrs. Bethune asked to speak and Mary Church Terrell was present, Madam C.G. Walker was present, and Mary Church Terrell prophesied because Mrs. Bethune had spoken so passionately, so eloquently. She prophesied that Mrs. Bethune would one day lead the National Association of Colored Women. And that prophecy came true, 1924. She became the eighth national president of this organization, which was the highest position that a black woman living in America could then aspire. And it uh, allowed her to not only uh, advance the interests of the organization, but also the things that she cared about, getting African Americans, in particular Black women, uh, more involved politically. She was not able to do uh, all of the things that she had wanted to do um, because, you know, this organization, it was several years old by the time she took the helm. And so they were kind of set in their ways in some regards. So Mrs. Bethune has started formulating plans for a new organization of Black women, one that would be politically uh, motivated and politically driven. By this time, she's able to, uh, uh, she's in a position to create an organization such as this because she had gotten uh, the attention of presidents of the United States. President Calvin Coolidge, and then later President Herbert Hoover. She was invited to Washington to attend uh, or serve on their committees dealing with child welfare, hunger, education. And uh, that really put her on the map. But it's Franklin Roosevelt who really saw and understood the, the, the influence, the magnetism, and the power of Mary McLeod Bethune. So 1935 is an important year in Mrs. Bethune's life. She's awarded the Spingarn Medal from the NAACP, the highest uh, award given by that organization. She's uh, a vice president of the NAACP. She's um, a member of the board of the National Urban League. She's involved in all the various organizations, Black organizations at that time. Um, for 35, she's called to Washington by President Roosevelt to serve as a special advisor to the National Youth Administration. And you know that we're in the midst of the Great Depression during this time period, and Roosevelt has created these uh, programs for his New Deal, as he called it. The New Deal uh, agencies, the alphabet agencies, created to combat the Great Depression. And the National Youth Administration was created to create jobs and provide vocational training for uh, youth in America, ages 16 to 25. She was brought in because of her work, of course, her expertise as an educator building her school. And uh, he was so impressed with her work that the following year, 1936, he creates for her within the agency, her own department, that uh, Division of Negro Affairs, at which time at the age of 61, Mary McLeod Bethune becomes the first African-American woman to head a federal agency. So when you talk about the role of African-Americans, uh, of women, in particular Black women, in politics, working in the federal government, working within the system, Mary McLeod Bethune is a trailblazer. She's a, certainly a trailblazer. And so in that position, she um, 
is able to uh, create these jobs. She's able to bring a lot of attention to the plight of historically black colleges and universities, making sure that the, 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 the budget for these schools, the money is set aside to send to these schools uh, uh, throughout the country, these black institutions. Mary McLeod Bethune is also one of the founders of the United Negro College Fund as well. A lot of people don't realize that. So she made a great impact um, in America uh, during this time period, during the Great Depression with the Roosevelt administration. It's also during this time period that she convenes the Federal Council on Negro Affairs, also known as the Black Cabinet, also known as the Black Brain Trust. And it was called the Black Cabinet or the Black Brain Trust in the press at this time. Uh, and just as she brought together uh, Black women, Mrs. Bethune united 19 Black men who were all uh, advisors or employees within the federal uh, government. And it was her idea that um, this group would serve as an informal cabinet to Roosevelt and his administration. She held weekly meetings at her home in Washington, where she uh, encouraged each member to attack racial discrimination in government and facilities, and when possible, to open opportunities for African Americans in government jobs. So Mrs. Bethune pushed for the hiring of more Black, uh, black Americans, in particular Black women, in the federal government. Specific accomplishments include uh, various meetings with President Roosevelt. You see here an image, uh, one of my favorite images of Mrs. Bethune holding up a, a picket sign in protest. This was a protest of People's Drug Store, which was a very popular uh, pharmacy, pharmaceutical chain here in Washington as part of the New Negro Alliance's Don't Buy Where You Can Work, Where You Can't Work. Don't Buy When You Can't Work campaign in 1940. So Mrs. Bethune uh, essentially took Washington by storm. She moves to Washington, you know, 1936, and she really just got involved in every area she could as relates to trying to advance her interest. Now, when talking about Mary McLeod Bethune, you have to understand that her four greatest passions were education, youth, women, and race. The plight of African Americans. Those were her four greatest passions. And whatever she was involved, she was going to uh, address those issues. Those were her concerns. She cared about the plight of her black boys and girls, as she so often say. Here you see images of uh, President Roosevelt's family. You see an image of Mrs. Bethune and his mother, Sarah Delano Roosevelt. They became very good friends. But it's first lady Eleanor Roosevelt, his wife, with whom Mrs. Bethune uh, became uh, more uh, friendly or worked with. Um, there are some people who uh, say that Mrs. Bethune certainly benefited from the relationship or friendship uh, with the Roosevelt, particularly Eleanor Roosevelt, and that is true. Um, but in a lot of cases, Mrs. Bethune, it was Mrs. Bethune, it was Eleanor Roosevelt, knowing Mrs. Bethune, that um, in some instances influenced Mrs. Roosevelt's decisions as it relates to issues of civil rights. One such issue that I can think readily of is the uh, incident in which Marion Anderson was denied from singing um, at Constitution Hall, when she was barred from singing there by the Daughters of the American Revolution. Well, uh, Ms. Bethune and Marion Anderson were very good friends. In fact, um, it's been said that they were distant cousins as well. And because of this relationship with Marion Anderson, Mrs. Bethune is the one who notified Mrs. Uh, 
Mrs. Roosevelt about this um, incident. And that is said to be the reason, or the, the, the uh, impetus for why Mrs. Roosevelt resigned her membership from the Daughters of the American Revolution, and which set about the chain of events that led to Marion Anderson's Easter Sunday concert on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in 1939. So that's just one example of Mrs. Bethune, uh, you know, bringing the Roosevelt's or making them aware of things that were happening. And Mary McLeod Bethune, another important aspect I want to mention is that she's a part of this shift during this time period, during the age of, of Franklin Roosevelt, where you've got African Americans leaving the Republican Party, the party of Lincoln, coming over to the Democratic Party. That begins when, uh, when Frederick, uh, excuse me, Franklin Roosevelt, when he's on the presidential ticket in uh, 1932, I believe, that election. So she's a part of that shift. So she was a, a major player in uh, politics, although she would often say that, um, you know, she, she was not there as a politician. She was there as an, as an educator. But um, Mrs. Bethune, don't, don't be fooled. She was an astute politician. She knew how to get people to, to, to do what she wanted. Here you see more images of Mrs. Bethune. 1935 is also the year that she starts the National Council of Negro Women. Um, she gets the idea to finally unveil this, this idea, this project. It was her intention to, for this organization to be an umbrella organization, to be an organization of organizations trying to bring about an awareness about the plight of Black women, not only in America, but throughout the world. And so that is why she creates the National Council of Negro Women. Mrs. Bethune is active in World War II as well, serving as an advisor to President Harry Truman. She selects the first 40 African-American women to serve in the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps during World War II. So Mrs. Bethune handpicked the first 40 Black women to serve in the armed forces of this country. She's named an honorary general to the Women's Army for National Defense by the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson. And uh, during World War II, she inspects hospitals, she inspects training camps, making sure that the soldiers, the Black soldiers are being treated uh, equally or fair on par with the white soldiers. She encourages integrate, uh, integration as much as possible within the armed forces as well. So she was a force during World War II. Here you see images of Mrs. Bethune um, at the White House outside the, the gates or on the steps of the White House. Um, one aspect to Mrs. Bethune's uh, work or popularity because she was a celebrity of sorts was that of the black press. She understood um, that image and perception was important. And so she and the council, and this is a time period wherein they were responsible for changing the image and perception of Black women. So the idea to be photographed, standing in front of the White House, walking to the White House, wearing their, their fur coats, their, their stoles, their hats, their gloves, their pointed shoes. It went a long way to change the way that Black women were perceived, the image. Again, you see Mrs. Bethune during World War II. Note her uniform as uh, commander of the Women's Army for National Defense. I get a kick out of that, um, of her being in that full uniform. Mrs. 
Mrs. Bethune is an international figure. And again, she was concerned not only with uh, the plight of Black Americans, but the plight of people of African descent throughout the world. Keeping that in mind, she was one of the three African American delegates sent from the NAACP to the very first meeting of the United Nations in San Francisco, California in 1945. Um, the other delegates were W.B. Du Bois and Walter White, longtime executive secretary of the NAACP. And you see Mrs. Bethune with President Harry Truman, Ralph Bunch, and Madam Pandit of India. So when Mrs. Bethune started the National Council of Negro Women in 1935, for many years, uh, the council was run out of her home. She had two homes here in Washington before she started looking for a headquarters for the organization. 1943, she purchased a Victorian row home located at 1318 Vermont Avenue Northwest, historic Logan Circle here in Washington. And this is what became the first national headquarters of the National Council of Negro Women, affectionately known as Council House. $15,500 is the amount that it cost. Uh, 10,000 of that came from Marshall Field. Marshall Field, um, of course, well known um, from Chicago. She found out that he was being uh, protested or picketed at that time because he was not he was allowing African Americans to, to, to shop, but they weren't hiring African American women in the stores. And so as a way to alleviate that bad, that negative press, she went to him, well, he uh, basically said that, um, you know, we're gonna have this little uh, 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 fund and any worthwhile civil rights organization that, you know, is about civil rights and have these issues, you know, that they're doing something in the community, something positive. We wanna, we wanna give you some money. Mr. Bethune heard about this, took the first train to Chicago and made the pitch of her life. Now, I'm sure that Field was only talking about a couple, few thousand dollars here and there, because, you know, you had different organizations, but Mrs. Bethune, after she made her pitch, she walked out with $10,000. And she brought that money back to Washington and she and the members raised the remaining money. And in 1944, um, they dedicated the council house. Eleanor Roosevelt was the featured speaker. So it's here at the council house that Mrs. Bethune and the council, they held their meetings. They had held press conferences, awards ceremonies, banquets, uh, you know, you name it, all types of events were held at the council house. When you come into the doors and enter the parlor, you see a beautiful crystal chandelier that uh, was reputed to have come from the White House, according to NCW folklore. Bethune, being a frequent visitor to the White House, happened to be there one day when uh, the White House was being renovated and she saw these workers taken down the chandelier, and she asked them, what are you gonna do with that chandelier? And they responded, it'd either go in storage or it'd probably be thrown away. But Mrs. Bethune was appalled, and she asked if she could have it because there was nothing wrong with the chandelier. And so they allowed her to have the chandelier, and she had it brought back to the council house and installed. And so um, when we have visitors at the council house, the lesson that we tell them when we tell the story, or the takeaway is that Mrs. Bethune would often say, we have not because we ask not. Mrs. Bethune encouraged people, particularly black women, 
to ask for what they wanted and to make demands just as other groups of people uh, make demands. So the uh, crystal chandelier is an example of making uh, a demand asking for what you want. More images from the council house. All types of people would have come through these doors to meet with Mary McLeod Bethune and the National Council of Negro Women. Ms. Bethune uh, retires from the presidency of the council in 1949. Um, but after her, there were three presidents who continued the work of the organization. Uh, those three presidents are pictured here in this photograph at the head of the table in the center. You have the third president, Vivian Carter Mason, to her left, uh, well, depending on where you're looking, the woman sitting beside her with the uh, croissage um, and the uh, white collar, that is the second president, Dr. Dorothy Bolding Farabee, and then sitting on the uh, at the table with the big black hat is the fourth president, Dr. Dorothy Irene Height, who led the council for more than 50 years. When I started at uh, the council house, Dr. Height had just passed away two or three months uh, prior. So her presence was most definitely felt there at the site. See here more images of meetings and dinners and teas. So the idea was to showcase that, that this organization, this African-American organization, these African-American women were making a presence in Washington. Now, a lot of people forget that Washington was a segregated city. And there were places in Washington where if you were black, you were not welcome. Uh, hotels and motels, you could be turned away. So realizing this, Mrs. Bethune decided to open up the third floor of the home as boarding room spaces for women, for black women, when they were coming into Washington uh, and they didn't have a place to stay. So that not only provided a veil of uh, safety and protection for these black women, but it also brought in some revenue, excuse me, for the organization. Another important aspect to Mary McLeod Bethune, uh, her life, her legacy, her work, is the idea of preserving history. Mary McLeod Bethune was a chronicler of Black history, uh, in particular, preserving Black women's history. And as early as 1939, she and the council started a national, uh, a national archives for Negro uh, women's history, as it would have been called. She recognized the importance of preserving historical records about the rich and diverse contribution of Black women in particular to American culture. And this archive literally started right there in the house, in their boardroom. And you see her with her good friend, the father of African American history, the man who created what we celebrate today as Black History Month, Dr. Carter G. Woodson. In 1915, Dr. Woodson established the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, known today as ASAWA, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And in 1936, Mary McLeod Bethune became its first female president. Uh, president. Dr. Woodson realized um, the reach that Mrs. Bethune had and he needed someone at the helm to try to bring about an awareness to Black life, Black history, and Black culture. And Mrs. Bethune, in her position with the Roosevelt administration, she lectured throughout the country. 
speaking and throughout her speeches, she disseminated little nuggets about black history. So uh, their relationship and the reason she believed in preserving this history was twofold. Mary McLeod Bethune was also very uh, prolific in terms of her writings. Uh, she published in the National Association of Colored Women's National Notes. Um, she had columns in the Pittsburgh Courier, uh, the Chicago Defender for many years. Um, she published from NCNW's uh, Afro-American Women's Journal, their quarterly magazine, their newsletter, The Telefact as well. Um, so she was well known for her, her speeches and her writings. Finally, you see some images of Mrs. Bethune with her family. She and her husband uh, later separated. And, um, there are a lot of, you know, uh, suspicions as to why they separated. Mrs. Bethune often said that um, her uh, husband was uh, not all that supportive of her work uh, as an educator building her school. She was spending a lot of time, of course, outside the home, something that was at that time not, uh, not as well received as it is today. So uh, their marriage suffered because of that. But she was able to, you know, raise their son and and care for him as best as she could a lot of times. Because she was always traveling, speaking, raising funds, she had to leave him in the care of others. And later in life, she uh, talks about that. And that was one of her regrets that she had, that she wasn't able to spend as much time with her son. Um, and she often said that, you know, she didn't have one child, she had two, Albert and Bethune Cookman College. So you see her with her son, uh, and then the other images are Mrs. Bethune with her grandson, her oldest, uh, or her grandchildren, her oldest grandson, um, pictured there at the top right-hand corner. Um, she adopted, so she adopted her grandson. He actually just passed away uh, I want to say two or three years ago. He was 96 years old. So he lived a very long time, as did her son, Albert. Albert died the year I was born, and I believe he was 90 years old when he passed. So came from a family of long livers. Mrs. Bethune's legacy. So the council uh, continued to be um, or reside at the council house until 1966. That's when a fire occurred, so they had to relocate. And Dorothy Height, the fourth president, got the idea to restore the home and to open it to the public as a monument or memorial to uh, not just the council and Ms. Bethune, but the contributions of Black women in America. So Dr. Betty Carter Thomas, who's pictured here, noted historian, author, preservationist, um, was brought on to head the the restoration effort of the home there. So November 11th, 1979, the home was restored and open to the public as the Mary McLeod Bethune Memorial Museum. And then also the carriage house that's out, that was out back there at the, house, uh, at the property was turned into an archive, the National Archives for Black Women's History. Until 2014, that archive was still on site in the carriage house. It's now uh, located at our Museum Resource Center in Landover, Maryland. Uh, there in our archive are the records of not only Mrs. Bethune and the National Council of Negro Women, but Dorothy Height. Uh, we have a collection from Faith Ringgold, other well-known Black women and their organizations. We have uh, other material culture there in the archive. So many stories are waiting to be processed and digitized. So if you ever were in need of 
information on Mrs. Bethune's account of Black women, you can certainly um, let our archivists know. Once the world opens back up, <laughs> you'd be able to visit and conduct some serious research. Once Mrs. Bethune passed away in 1955, um, shortly thereafter, Dr. Hyde and the National Council of Negro Women began planning to erect a statue of Mrs. Bethune uh, in Lincoln Park in Washington, D.C. Because of the uh, everything that took place during the Civil Rights Movement from the time of Mrs. Bethune's death to the early 70s, they had to kind of put the the plans, the fundraising uh, on the back burner for this monument, but July 10th, 1974, on the 99th anniversary of Mrs. Bethune's birthday, the National Council of Negro Women dedicated this statue of Mrs. Bethune, the Mary McLeod Bethune Memorial in Lincoln Park, Northeast Washington, DC. It is the first memorial honoring an African-American and a woman on a federal land in a public park in the nation's capital. So this, we uh, maintain and manage this park as well. We celebrate Mrs. Bethune's birthday every year. Celebrations for many years were held in the actual park, right there in front of the statue, over 18,000 people were there on that hot July day, 1974, to dedicate that statue with Dr. Height and the National Council of Negro Women, Shirley Chisholm, Coretta Scott King, Dick Gregory, Cicely Tyson, who just passed. So it was a wonderful event and the, the statue continues to be a, uh, an important uh, place or landmark in Washington there in Lincoln Park. I forgot to include an image of the statue of uh, Abraham Lincoln. When they put Bethune statue in, the statue honoring Abraham Lincoln, Freeman's uh, memorial, that statue originally faced west toward the Capitol. But when they put Bethune statue in on the other end of the park, they rotated. MCNW had to get congressional authorization to rotate Lincoln statue around to face Bethune's. So you're looking, the statues, the statues are facing one another. What a juxtaposition. Um, the great emancipator on one end, and then Mrs. Bethune, you know, the daughter of enslaved people on the other end of the park. 1985, Mrs. Bethune became the second African-American to be placed on a postage stamp. She has schools named for her all over the country, all types of awards. The National Council of Negro Women is still in existence today. Their current chair and president is Dr. Janetta B. Cole. And happening this year, Mrs. Bethune is going to be going to the U.S. Capitol once again. Um, the state of Florida voted in 2018 to uh, place a statue of Mrs. Bethune in Statuary Hall, uh, replacing Confederate General Edmund Smith. So they're hoping for that statue to, excuse me, be unveiled in uh, sometime later this year. This will be the first African-American, or Mrs. Bethune will be the first African-American to represent a state specifically. So she'll be representing the state of Florida. So years after her death, Mary McLeod Bethune is still making history. All the images that you've seen throughout the presentation um, are just some of the thousands 
that we have at our National Archives for Black Women's History. Um, you have my contact information here, as well as the addresses for our historic sites. We have uh, amazing uh, online virtual programming planned throughout the month in honor of Black History Month. And then also remember Women's History Month is coming up in March. So we've got some amazing things planned for that, as well as for the remainder of the year. We've had to really pivot like everybody else um, in trying to you know, come up with different ways to get people involved, get them uh, learning about this history since they cannot come visit the site physically. In the case of the Council House, you can go online to our website, uh, uh, have created an online virtual tour. So a lot of uh, what you saw today in terms of images in the house, you can actually see the house and you can see the artifacts and learn more about the work that was done by the National Council of Negro Women at the Council House. That is the end. I thank you all for listening. And uh, Mrs. Dickinson, I'm willing to take any questions that anyone may have. So um, I think people are gathering some of their questions together. Thank you so very much. What uh, amazing, mind-blowingly amazing, wonderful woman. Thank you. Did. Did she ever express, did she ever not succeed in something she set out to? Was she just blessed to pick the right things and find the right conditions? You, we all would think about how difficult it would be for a, a, a smart black woman in those days. So. Yeah, yeah. So um, just think if, if she's the 15th of 17, if she had been the born the 13th or the 14th, just think she would have still, she would have been born enslaved. So when you look at when she was uh, born, you know, she, she was just, she was special. She was set apart. Um, like I, I use the word anointed as well. Um, everyone who came into contact with her, they talk about she had a, uh, she carried a light, like literally, like if you saw her, um, she had an aura, light emanated from her. And, you know, uh, whatever she wanted to do, for the most part, she was able, she did it. She was able to accomplish it. But there is one thing that she did, she kind of played with the idea of doing, and that was running for Congress. Um, she had, talked about at some point in the, I think late 40s, early 50s, um, she was good friends with Adam Clayton Powell and uh, really his father, was, she was close friends with. And she talked about maybe running for Congress in uh, New York, uh, trying to take Adam Clayton Powell's seat. But that's the only thing that I can think of that, uh, you know, she, necessarily wasn't able to <laughs> but again I don't, I don't know how serious she was about that but even with not being able to go to africa when she you know graduated from okay. you know, moody bible institute you know that really that really broke her heart that she couldn't go but she did eventually get to go and how about that she when she went she went as a representative of her country uh it was a the uh, president of Liberia, William Tubman's inauguration. And for whatever reason, uh, President Truman couldn't go. So he sent Mrs. Bethune in his stead. So to not be able to go, you know, all those many years earlier due to, you know, prejudice, and then to be able to go uh, as a representative of, of your, your country, your nation. Talk about a full circle moment. Uh, she visited uh, Liberia, traveled other African, uh, several other countries, um, 
Dr. Robertson Preston, who I mentioned before in her book, she looks at Mrs. Bethune's internationalism and uh, her visits to Cuba, um, Haiti. Um, she received the, uh, the, uh, an award, the Medal of, of Honor from Haiti, Haiti's highest award, uh, the Star of Africa. I mean, she traveled to, to, to Europe and had an audience with the Pope and Lady Nancy Astor. I mean, Mrs. Bethune, she, while she was a nationally known figure, she had an international presence and an international outlook. We have a, a question about a little bit more detail about when she started the archives, how old was she in her career? Who were some of the inspirations that helped her gather all that together? So a little bit more detail on that. Okay, so the National Council of Negro Women starts the archives of 1939. Um, not only, again, did she, was she influenced by Dr. Carter G. Woodson, um, but also Mary Beard, who started the, uh, the, the, uh, the World Center for Women's Archives. I think I just botched that name, but it's Mary Beard who uh, had a similar idea as well. But Mrs. Bethune, working with Dr. Woodson and working with Asala uh, closely, kind of got the idea to, to, to fashion that as uh, catered to Black women. So 1939 is when that begins. And, uh, you know, again, it started uh, later when they purchased the home. Another reason why they wanted a headquarters was because they wanted a place dedicated to this archive for people to come. She, the council wrote when they sent out their newsletter and uh, their magazine, they wrote black women, send us your family heirlooms, send us your important things so we can build our archive. So that was uh, 1939. Um, of course that archive grew. Um, so what we have today, um, a lot of the records from the council, that is the nucleus of the archive. Um, uh, you asked about her age. So Mrs. Bethune uh, in 1935, probably the most important year of her life, she's 60 years old. And so I think that's pretty amazing as well. Wow. Is old, you know, at a time when people are thinking about retiring, and, you know, settling down, Mrs. Bethune was tackling another, you know, another career, if you will. Yeah. It's amazing. And also, Mrs. Bethune suffered with chronic asthma. Oh. And so all the traveling that she had to do uh, working in the roles of administration, I mean, she lectured all over this country, speaking. So just imagine uh, all the traveling, the airplanes, the trains, and, and, and trying to do all this work. Uh, she did have uh, suffered with chronic asthma. And so there are a few times where she did have to get, uh, be hospitalized because of, of that asthma. Um, I, I believe she did have high blood pressure as well. So, you know, there were some, some drawbacks or some side effects of being who she was and working as hard as she did. And although she dies in 1955, um, well, she, she retires from the council. She retires from Bethune-Cookman in uh, 1942. And then she had to resume the presidency again for a year, and I think 47. But she retires from the council in 1949. Now, when you're someone like Mary McLeod Bethune, I guess technically you never really retire. <laughs> so um, she did try to cut back, but uh, because of health issues, but you know, she was still a pretty powerful figure. Wow. We're getting many, many comments thanking you for a wonderful presentation. People thought they knew about Dr. or Mrs. Bethune, but they're learning more. Um, I will send out a to uh, an email to everybody that was a chance to register tonight for the program through Zoom with the contact information. Uh, so Mr. Fowler and the three the three museums and the uh, Capitol Hill Parks area. So I'll get that together and email that to those of you that have registered. Um, 
Oh, do you? Oh, here's one more question. Do you think she played a part in the Great Migration? That's an interesting question. So, yeah, in her own way. Um, in some ways, I guess you could say that she was a part of the Great Migration. <laughs> that, you know, she, you know, born in South Carolina, um, spends 50 years in Daytona Beach, you know, building her school and serving as a member of the community there in Florida. But then she comes to Washington. And so she's traveling in between Washington and Daytona Beach for, uh, what, 10 to 15 years. And, and between those times, she's, you know, uh, you know, mentoring countless numbers, countless scores of, of young men and women. Um, W. Johnson Roundtree, the noted civil rights uh, activist, attorney, minister. Um, she served, she was one of the women that Mary McLeod Bethune uh, selected to be, to join the armed forces in the Women's Auxiliary Corps. You know, she's an example of someone that Mrs. Bethune picked, uh, you know, from where she was, bringing her, you know, up north and, and, and things like that. So, uh, yeah, probably I, I'd say, you know, working with and traveling, meeting with all these young people, trying to, you know, get them to join her, her organizations. Yeah, she, she played a role in, in bringing folks, uh, you know, from the South to various parts. Uh, Wonderful. Wait, I want, oh. Oops. I think we lost you. Okay. One last thing. I do have a book. What do you think the best book about her or? So, so I mentioned um, Mary McLeod Bethune in Florida, Bringing Social Justice to the Sun State by Dr. Ashley Robertson Preston. Um, another great book is by Dr. Ida E. Jones, who is currently uh, the archivist at Morgan State University. I think I had some Morgan State alums on here. Uh, her book is Mary McLeod Bethune in Washington, D.C., um, which focuses on the work of Mrs. Bethune um, as a Washington, D.C. resident, and specifically the work of the National Council of Member Women in Logan Circle at the Council House. Um, another great book, uh, there is not a, Mrs. Bethune does not have a, uh, an autobiography, but the closest thing would be um, a collection of her speeches and essays and other writings, uh, Mary McLeod Bethune, Building a Better World. And that was edited by Elaine Smith and uh, Dr. Audrey Thomas McCluskey. I'm actually going to be uh, doing a program with Dr. McCluskey. Uh, I'll be speaking with her in a couple of weeks, but this program will be for March. So uh, Dr. McCluskey has written extensively on Mary McLeod Bethune as well. Um, there's a great journal, a great article that she did. Um, I wanna say it's for the Journal of Negro History and it's on JSTOR, um, Mary McLeod Bethune's Legacy, Her Last Will and Testament. Um, that is probably Mrs. Bethune's most famous literary work, her last well, in Testament, it first appeared in Ebony Magazine. Well, anyway, Dr. McCluskey, in her article, uh, analyzes um, uh, Mrs. Bethune's legacy. Um, and then also our historic resource study for the Mary McLeod Bethune Council House. That uh, is another great uh, resource as well. It's, we call that our Bible because in the park service, in order to, you know, for a site to enter the system, there has to be a significant amount of research and work done. And so uh, the study that came about from that for us was written by Elaine Smith as well. And it's called, um, oh Lord, I can't think of what it's called, um, but it's, it's for the uh, Mary McLeod Bethune Council House Oh, Pursuing a True and Unfettered Democracy by Elaine Smith for the uh, Bethune Council House. So yeah, 
though those are some uh, works on Mrs. Bethel. Wow, very impressed. Thank you so much for your time. I want everybody to know that this is the second program. Mr. Fowler got to talk to a group, a big group of Girl Scouts earlier. So yeah. <laughs> we appreciate him coming and picking this up. If you have any other questions, you can pass them to me at the library. As I said, in a few days, we'll get his contact information out to you. And thank you so much for coming, Mr. Fowler. Wonderful, wonderful program. Thank you for having me and thank everyone for, you know, attending. Um, stay safe and continue to celebrate Black History Month. <laughs> thank you. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.